Hello, it's Writing Wednesday. Uh, I'm Janet Fitch, and I'm here to talk about, today we'll talk about music and musicality in writing. I got a letter from uh, uh, Shiana Ochoa. And as you know, musicality is in writing is um, something that can be learned. Uh, you're not born with it any more than you're born knowing how to play the oboe. Um, some people are naturally musical and some people can learn to hear it. Most people can learn to hear it because that's why human beings like music. Uh, it's part of, part of the species. Um, I had a whole, uh, an experience when I was learning to write. Hi. I had an experience when I was learning to write, um, of sending my stuff out month after month, year after year, literally nine years, sending out stories that I thought were really good and having them be, uh, returned with nice little notes, uh, but very little encouragement. And finally, I got a really nice rejection. You learn a lot from rejections. Hi. Uh, you learn a lot from rejections. Uh, and this rejection was just, you know, uh, I was so lucky to receive it. So generous. Um, uh, it was Jim Crusoe, who is a wonderful writer. If you ever take a look at him, he was editing the Santa Monica Review. And he said, good enough story, but what's unique about your sentences? And my sentences, you know, what the hell is he talking about my sentences? Uh, what did he want me to do? Start all the words with B, you know? But he was referring to this musicality. It took me a long time to figure that out because I'm not, you know, always that quick on the draw. Um, <laughs> but I did eventually figure it out. Oh my God, you know, there's a lot more writing than just writing a good story. Uh, if it's not exciting to read, if it's not a pleasure to read sentence by sentence, uh, you're missing half of what it is to write. And uh, I re recall this, uh, I got a letter from uh, Sheena, uh, Shiana Ochoa, Hi, Janet. Uh, hope you'll see this and know, uh, as I know it was from last week, but I didn't have the question last week. Music in writing. What I mean is I'm on the second draft of my novel and sent a chapter to my hubby, only because I need to submit the work in progress to a writer's residency. And he said it didn't sing. And I thought, well, Jesus, that doesn't happen until several drafts in. I may even throw out this whole chapter. But then I wondered if maybe I shouldn't wait for the final drafts. Maybe the music could be part of the early writing rewriting. So my question is, when do you fine tune the work in progress, nix the Latinate verbs, the multisyllabic verbs, uh, and work on the rhythm? Okay. So that is a really, hi, that is a really good uh, um, question. Uh, it's an intrinsic question to the art of writing. And the art of writing is the art of writing sentences. Uh, the musicality for me obviously came very late, years too late, <laughs> but I finally got it. And uh, for me, I started by by writing, uh, by reading poetry, which I had never read much poetry. I'm a big prose writer, big prose reader. Novels were my thing, you know. Um, and, uh, but I realized that what I lacked was the poetics, the music uh, of, of that sentence. And it doesn't mean sentences have to be long and lyrical because there's a poetic, uh, there are poetics in very short, and se uh, short sentences as well. You know, there is a poetic uh, in even Hemingway. There's, um, there is a music in the sentence. And it, it's very clear if you take a, if you read poetry out loud, and I recommend reading out poetry out loud before you write, uh, bec and then reading your own stuff out loud as well. And then it's like, wow, then you can really see, gee, that 
that sentence doesn't have any music to it. There's, it's, it's clunk, clunk, clunk. So the musicality of a sentence. Um, I, for example, there are certain books or even certain pieces of a book that will be informed by a certain poet. So for me, um, uh, Dylan Thomas is always my go-to guy. Uh, he's so musical that you can't not hear the music. And then there's prose I brought in that I can hear Dylan Thomas in the poet in the prose of Lee Young Lee, who is a poet. But he, the cadences that he uses uh, in his prose, I mean, I can I can hear the Dylan Thomas in them, which is not a slam. Um, when I was writing um, Paint It Black, uh, there was a lot of Anne Sexton and the Four Quartets by um, by uh, T.S. Eliot. And there's a rhythm and a sound to this that you'll probably recognize. Uh, it's very simple, and it but it rings like a kind of like a, a bell over a devastated town. Boom, boom. Um, uh, let's, you know, time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. Now, can you hear the rhythm of that? And time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. What might have been is an abstraction, remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. What might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present. Footfalls echo in the memory down the passage we did not take towards the door we never opened into the rose garden. If anybody's read Paint It Black, they'll hear this. My words echo thus in your mind, but to what purpose? Disturbing the dust on a bowl of rose leaves, I do not know. Other echoes inhabit the garden. Shall we follow? Quick, said the bird, find them, find them, round the corner, through the first gate, into our first world. We shall f shall we follow the deception of the thrush into our first world, etc. Pick the sound that you like. You know, these poets will speak to you. You can always hear them reading their own work. Um... Oh, thank you. Uh, somebody's reading Paint It Black. You're going to hear overtones of Sexton and of T.S. Eliot, the four quartets uh, in that. Um, a lot of Russian poets in Marina M. You'll hear Bra Joseph Brodsky very strongly, although he was a generation younger. You'll hear Akhmatova. You'll hear Tsvetaeva. Um, but it tunes your ear. So for musicality, how to, how to work on your musicality, first you have to listen. And it's best listen to the poet, read his, own, his or her own work aloud. But then get, get their book and read it out loud to yourself. Have it in your head 10 minutes before you write. Then when you write, read it out loud and you will hear the clunkiness of sentences. What causes the clunkiness of sentences? First of all is when you, you're not thinking about the musicality. You're just trying to get Debbie into the room and move her around and, you know, have Chuck scream at her and, you know, it's like, it's all I can handle just to get the characters doing what they're doing, you know. Um, so that's what, what Sheena's um, question is, when do you start working on the language? Um, I start working on it pretty soon after I write it. So the next day I'll go back and rewrite what I wrote the day before to continue, so the voice will be the same. But I read that out loud, and I'll read poetry before out loud. Then I'll read what I've written, and you can hear when you're falling over 
an extra syllable that doesn't belong there, or you'll hear clunk, 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 oh wow, you know, or it'll feel like mush in your mouth compared to what you, the poetry you've read. Often that's a lack of interesting consonants, that you just find a crunchier word. You know, uh, I recommend reading, if you like a crunchy sentence, uh, um, uh, Rachel Kushner, uh, read either of her books. You know, I love Flamethrowers. Uh, the new one is, is very good, too. And she writes a really crunchy, good, crunchy, lots of Ks, lots of uh, uh, corners, I call it, in your mouth. If it doesn't, if it tastes like, oat, if, it, if it feels like oatmeal when you're reading it, you'll notice it more if you've read it after you've read some poetry, it, how it feels in your mouth. Then the ear. Um... When you start listening to the music, you'll notice that certain words make the sentence, make the, the stresses fall in the right place. And you don't have to know anything about poetry to know this. You know, just by hearing it, you'll hear it. Just like you can hear a flat note. <laughs> Even if you don't know the piece of music, it's like, ah! Or you can tell when a beginner is stumbling. You can tell even if you don't know anything about music and you haven't read that, you know, the, that sheet music. So, for instance, you know, when hubby, um, hi, <laughs> you work on the musicality because you work on yourself. The musicality is about you as a writer. And the musicality is in you. So what you're trying to do is train the musicality into yourself. It might not be the first thing off your pen, but when you go back to read it aloud the next day, you'll hear it and you'll go, hmm, how can I make that sound better? Um, I am currently uh, finishing, I've finished my copy edits, my proofs will go out, my galleys will go out. Ah, so I'm getting um, a, I have a wonderful copy editor at uh, Little Brown as my publisher. But they have, they have suggestions for you. And some of them are great, but some of them don't take the poetics into account. So, for instance, I have a, I have a sentence. Um, and in California, where Uncle Vadim sleeps, uh, slept, the sun had just come up. And she wants to change it because she's keeping track of when the sun actually came up in 1919 in California, <laughs> yeah, she said, uh, and in California where Uncle Vadim slept, the sun had recently come up. Do you see the poet? The poetry is off. The, the, the music is off. When I say, and in California where Uncle Vadim slept, the sun had just come up. That has a sound to it. Whereas, and in California where Uncle Vadim slept, the sun had recently come up. The recently, it's it takes a stress where you don't want it, and it screws up the poetics of the line. So I said, no, let's just leave that one as is. Um, you're looking for sometimes just a, I know there's another one in here. Oh, it's up a little bit more. Um... um there's one where she looks into a train car and there are the, the shell in the boxcars at the time, they made shelves for people to sleep on uh, when on these long journeys uh, into the countryside to get out of town and find some food. And let's see if I can find that one. So the, the word was uh, she looks in and sees sees these people are hanging in the doorway. They don't want to get off the train. And she sees behind them uh, their wooden bunks rayed behind them like shelves in a poor shop. And she wanted to say arrayed. But their wooden bunks arrayed behind... I don't like the way that sounds. I don't like it. Um, there's something about the insertion of the extra syllable. So sometimes it'll be an extra syllable that makes or breaks the, the, the movement of the line. Um, so I urge you to uh, spend that time to listen to your sentences. If you, are, if, you were, if you had to read this 
piece of your novel, uh, Sheena. If you, uh, if you had to read this piece of your novel aloud, would you make changes so that it had a certain sound to it? Um, so the first thing in musicality is, is the ear, training the ear. That made the biggest difference in my writing when I started um, reading it out loud, reading poetry that was very, you know, very musical, where the, the voice was very strong, not, not necessarily poetry that, that, that is a poetry for the eye, and it's all about the breaks and the way it's arrayed on the page. There's poetry for the ear. And uh, you listen to that poetry, and then you read your own stuff, and you ask yourself, does that make the music? You'll, you'll be much more sensitized to it. Um, and then you will change, you'll rewrite, you'll find if, the, if it's very bland, if you find it, it sounds bland, it feels bland in your mouth, you'll sharpen up that language so that there's something interesting in your mouth. And you'll train your ear to notice, is there um, an, extra, an extra syllable that kind of makes it limp, you know, or hits the emphasis on the wrong word. Um, you'll be that aware. So yeah, I would say start training the ear when you go back the next day to start working again. Go back and read what you've already written aloud and start working on that musicality. Um, now there's the question we had last week or the week before about the overwriters, people who are just in love with language and just love it and just the sound of it is the most important thing. You know, they're the ones who have to be a little more careful um, to make sure that the foundation is there, that they really have written what they intended to say in a clear way and then made the music out of that rather than put everything in the stew, everything in the gumbo, and then trying try to sort it out once it's in there. Um, if you are honest with yourself, if you're just somebody who just loves to throw all the words in there, you know, start, try to write it simply and very, very clearly, and then subtly start opening it up, you know. But if you tend to write something that the hubby is saying, it doesn't sing. That's what we're looking for. Are the words that sing, we're looking for rhythm, words that have a shape, and flavor. Um, we talked about, the, when we talked about the senses, words that, um, that apply to more than one sense are the strongest words. So to say something is yellow appeals to one sense, sight. But to say a lemon sky, then you have a taste and you have a smell um, and a color. So three, the wine dark sea in Homer, wine, you know, uh, this is a color, this is a flavor, this is a scent. Um, and uh, any time you can get uh, multiple senses, it's going to sing more. It's going to have more richness, flavor, color, uh, scent. People always forget these. Um, to ma so make your writing sing. Uh, here is Lee Young Lee. Okay, so he has, this is such a Dylan Thomas rhythm. If you read a lot of Dylan Thomas, you'll notice he has a certain cadence. And then you read Lee Young Lee. <clears throat> this is uh, his memoir, which is so, it has such a Dylan Thomas sound to it. Um, where, let's find a really good one. Oh, God, here we go. <clears throat> night is night as is without hands. Night is nice, e night even if it's a basin of fire. Night is nice, night though it's tentacle and maelstrom. Night even a bloody custard, the body dear trough, even if my hand a possible face. Nobody's writing like that, I'm sure. <clears throat> I don't expect you to be writing your, your stories this way. But this is prose that is using... <clears throat> 
uses a very Dylan Thomas um, cadence. Oh, how may I touch you across this chasm, chasm of flown things? What won't the night overthrow the wind unright? Because part of your uh, criticism, the husband criticism of that it doesn't sing, it also doesn't stop to have thoughts often. You know, you're so busy trying to get characters and cross the room and open the door and sit down and do they, when do they drink their coffee and, you know, how do they interact with the person across from them, what are they seeing, that the author forgets to have thought, that the character will have thoughts, the point of view character will have thoughts. And the thoughts don't always have to be on the nose. The character doesn't always have to think about what they're doing. They can think about, they can wash the dishes and think about, you know, what is the night? They can watch the, wash the dishes late at night and look at their reflection of the kitchen window and think about the night and what happens in the night. So you don't always have to um, have thoughts that are so heavy footed. You can have poetic thoughts that sing. And then that, those can, you know, it's not going to be the whole dinner, you know, you don't want to just eat ice, cake icing, you know, you want to have, but you want it to be woven in. So there's always beauty in what you're writing. And if it doesn't have, you know, if it doesn't have that thread of beauty, it's not going to take anybody's breath away breath away, which is what you want to do. You want to take people's breath away and not just a tit tidal wave of language either. You know, we talked about control of language. So people who are word drunk have to, you know, have to watch it as well that it's not just music. You know, prose is a balance. But if you're getting the critique of what's unique about your sentences, or if this doesn't sing, this is how you make it sing. You get really good verbs, you get the senses in there, you get the cadence of language, um, you get the shape of words, you know, these beautiful words. You know, Dylan Thomas had so many beautiful birds in his poetry, uh, egrets and herons and and uh, curlews, he loved curlews. He, he didn't know what a curlew was. He had no idea. He, he probably couldn't recognize a robin if he saw one, but he loved the word curlew, you know. So, so this beautiful language can happen. So yeah, you know, as a, as a, uh, as a um, you know, can you imagine somebody sitting you know, waiting for somebody and having thoughts like this. I know this vicious minute's hour. It's a sa it is a sour motion in the blood that, like a tree, has roots in you and buds in you. You know, you can make a bigger comment about reality and human life. Um, so your poetry is going to sensitize you to that, uh, the music in life. Um, so, uh, if there's any questions, so to clarify, you work on the musicality while you're still working on the story. Yeah, you work on your own musicality at all times. Um, what I do when I read often is I, if I come across a sentence that's just beautiful, I'll put a check by it and I'll read it out loud to myself a couple times, just like mmm. That I used to be in a writer's workshop. Um, with Kate Braverman, and she, if there was a, if you had written a good line, she would stop and read it again. Mmm, mmm, yeah, yeah. She didn't care about the story so much, but she cared about those sentences, um, and you got to care about the sentences. That's the second half of writing. Is there anything else I can, uh, uh, can, any other questions I can answer? Um, Poets or musicians that were inspiring uh, with White Oleander. Uh, oh, that's a Sexton. That was a Sexton book. Anne Sexton uh, hovers over that book. Um, uh, let's see if I have a little Sexton for you. 
Oh, there she is. Now, this is a book that I've read so much. Uh, there's the spine. It's in two halves. You'll, you'll recognize, I think, uh, uh, I'll do a little sextant and then and then I'll let you go for <laughs> Okay. What do I want? Yeah, he's she's wonderful and to listen to her uh read to listen to her reading is um she's one to listen to. So you can really um, hear, you can hear the music, and you can also hear Dylan Thomas read his own stuff. Brodsky reads his own stuff. You can hear Elliot read his stuff. He's very dry, but he does it wonderfully. Here's a, here's just a little bit of where's a, what's a favorite one. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is called Ringing the Bells. This is a very, very Ingrid, uh, <laughs> very Ingrid <laughs> poem. And this is the way they ring the bells in Bedlam. Can you hear that music? You could write a, a sentence just like that. And this is the bell lady who comes each Tuesday morning to give us a music lesson. And because the attendants make you go, hear that? And because the attendants make you go and because we mind by instinct the like bees caught in the wrong hive we are the circle of the crazy ladies who sit in the lounge of the mental house and smile at the smiling woman who passes us each a bell who points at my hand that holds my bell e flat and this is the gray dress next to me who grumbles as if it were special to be old, to be old. And this is the s small hunched squirrel girl on the other side of me, who picks at the hairs over her lip, who picks at the hairs over her lip all day. And this is how the bells really sound, as untroubled and clean as a workable kitchen. Ah, a good metaphor is a beautiful thing. That's another thing that will make your work sing. As untroubled and clean as a workable kitchen. And look at those those consonants. As untroubled and clean as a workable kitchen. And this is always my bell responding to the hand that responds to the lady who points at me, E flat. And although they, we are no better for it, they tell you to go, and you do. So pick your favorite poems and just read them and have them in your mind. So yeah, definitely, definitely uh, uh, Anne Sexton is a huge influence on me. Um, so do you recommend... Howard. Hey, Howard. Uh, do you recommend writing with music in the background? Uh, I've done this in the past, and it really changes what I write, but I'm not sure why. I do. I write with... It depends on what I'm writing. Uh, I have a theme. I have a character named Anton in uh, in... Uh, the Revolution of Marina M. and Chimes of Lost Cathedral that I've just finished. And he has his lo his own love theme, which I found uh, soundtrack soundtracks are really good to write to because they have an implicit story, but they usually don't have singing. Uh, words, for me, I find words get in the way, but it, it they're very moody. I often write with uh, this, this last book uh, of Marina M., I write with... Uh, Tangerine Dream Sorcerer. It has a certain compulsive uh, urgency and kind of terror. Um, I yeah, I use that a lot. Um, but I this musicality, it's about language. So the poets will hold you in good stead um, for that. But yes, I use use music for mood. Um, 
it's tremendously helpful. I often listen to like a goth drone. I like Dead Can Dance and Bauhaus and uh, Russian Circles. Uh, just like rah, gives me uh, the mood often that I'm I'm looking for. Uh, it, it's uh, writing is always about um, yourself as an instrument and how are you going to play your instrument. And if it takes using some music to help you tune, if it takes listening, write, reading poetry out loud or listening to poetry read by its author to tune your ears. It, you know, this is your instrument and you need to be tuning. You can't just, no violinist just sits down, you know, in front of an audience and picks up the violin and ch -ch -ch, without having tuned that fucker sucker, excuse me, and, uh, you know, and practiced. And uh, so you're always tuning yourself. And uh, the musicality is, is very, is very important. The, the more you do it, the more you'll start reaching for that first time instead of writing it, and then rewriting it. But always for those who tend to overdo it, you know, don't take this as license to go and just drown us in a tidal wave of language. Um, that's not it either. You know, hear the individual music, but you always need the clarity of what the heck are we talking about. You know, that's always going to be first, and then the music does come second. Um, all right, any other questions? Happy to... answer anything all right well um if you like this please feel free to share uh encourages me to do it more and uh hope everybody's feeling well and everybody's been sick so we'll think about radiant health wish you radiant health and uh, we'll see you next week thanks <laughs>